let's talk about the basics of gas exchange. And to do that, we have to talk about this guy, the alveoli. This is where the magic of gas exchange happens. And as you all know, oxygen comes down and CO2 goes out. It's at this interface where gas exchange occurs. Now blood flows from the RV into the pulmonary artery, into the capillary membrane interface, back into the pulmonary veins, and back into the left ventricle out into the systemic circulation. Now in a perfect world, the amount of ventilation should equal the amount of perfusion. So the amount of ventilation happening at this alveolar unit should be equal to the perfusion or Q at this unit, and that should be one. Of course, the world is not perfect, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Just know that there are 600 million of these alveolar units within your lung, all participating in gas exchange. And if you take them all, flatten them out end to end, this would be the size of a tennis court. That is a tremendous amount of ventilation and perfusion that's happening in your lung right now. In a perfect world, your ventilation should match your perfusion. In other words, the ventilation happening here at the alveoli should match what's happening here through the pulmonary artery all the way to the pulmonary vein. In a perfect world, everything is perfectly matched. However, the world is not perfect and diseases happen. So let's look at one end of the extreme where we have adequate ventilation, but we have a drop in perfusion. Examples of this would be the trachea. In the trachea, there's lots of air that's going in and out. However, there's no blood flow to oxygenate or remove CO2 on those areas. Pathologically, we can talk about pulmonary embolism. With a PE, what happens is there's a blood clot that comes and gets stuck right here. So this decreases perfusion at this alveolus while there is normal ventilation happening. This is known as space ventilation. Dead space ventilation is anytime you have adequate ventilation with a decrease in your perfusion. Let's look at a situation where we have a decrease in our ventilation and we have normal perfusion. An example of this is anything that disrupts the alveolus or decreases gas exchange at this capillary alveolar membrane. If you had a situation like pneumonia where the alveolus fills with fluid, this would decrease gas exchange across. If you had a situation like pulmonary edema, we have fluid within the alveolus but also around. And ARDS is very much the same thing. Here we have an inflammation within the alveolus and around it. Any way you slice it, there is a decrease in the ability to ventilate this alveolus with normal blood flow. And this is called shunt. It's called shunt because you're shunting blood from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, much like you'd have with a PFO or VSD. Here, deoxygenated blood bypasses the lungs and goes into the left side also deoxygenated. When you have shunt physiology happening at the alveolar level, the same thing happens. You have blood that's crossing over from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart without the benefits of ventilation. Now, even when things are normal in the lung, when there's no pathology at all, VQ matching is not equal to one. When you look at the entire lung together, the V to the Q is actually 0.8. And this varies within the lung tissue itself. Ventilation is much better at the apices than it is at the base of the lung. When you consider perfusion, perfusion actually happens better as we get closer to the bases of the lungs. So there's regional variation in VQ throughout the lung, but the overall average in a normal lung is about 0.8. That's actually not bad. Way to go, human body. Now when patients lay flat and have pathology, things get a little bit interesting. Because as we said before, normally ventilation is higher at the apices than it is down at the base of the lungs. But when you add pathology on top of that, what you find is that the alveoli that are closer to the ventral part of the body are more open and have less fluid. And gravity pulls the fluid down like an ARDS and causes there to be de-recruitment of these alveoli. Not to mention the weight of the body pushing down on that lung as well as the force of the heart. For that reason, the alveoli at the ventral surface of the patient are more aerated and more open, and the ones that are more basal or more posterior tend to be smaller. The one thing that doesn't change is that perfusion is better at the bases here, so you'll inherently see a problem. We have well-ventilated alveoli, which we have less of ventrally with less blood flow as compared to the ones that are more posterior, of which there are many of, but they're more collapsed down and they're not ventilated as well. So here again, we have more ventilation with less perfusion down here, we have much, much less ventilation with a lot more perfusion. And the other thing to remember is the weight of the heart 
as well as the chest wall is pushing things down, making these posterior segments collapse down even more. If only there was a way we could just flip things around. And by doing that, we're allowing these alveoli, which were compressed down to open up and ventilate better because these areas have more perfusion to start with. And we can also get the weight of the heart and the chest wall off of these alveoli to get better VQ matching throughout the entire lung. If only there was a way. Spoiler alert, there is. It's called prone ventilation, and it's what we're going to talk about on the very next Grit Bits.